we're going to talk about the interventional and device management in patients with adult congenital heart disease. Uh, I will discuss a few things that are a little off-label to get a vision into the future. I'm going to break down the next 20 minutes into the top 10 questions. I'm a 90s fan <laughs> of uh, Dave Letterman and uh, his lists. So, where can I go for guidelines I can trust? You guys have already heard a variety of talks that have talked about uh, the 2008, that's your original series. We had the reboot 2018, uh, the next generation of adult congenital guidelines. So very useful resources for our patients and for uh, our providers. We're still a little bit old on our implantable devices guidelines, still about a decade old now. But the 2014 PACES HRS guidelines have been cited multiple times. That's a reasonable source for uh, guidelines I trust, but verified. A good friend of mine told me, trust but verify. That's Dr. Franklin. So who or where should these EP perf, uh, studies be performed? And I'd like to start off with a patient, 40-year-old who came to us after an ASD repair way back in the day here at Texas Children's and reportedly a pulmonary valve inspection. These palpitations worsened, they were diagnosed with typical atrial flutter, and they underwent an ablation at an institution here in Houston, but he showed up to me with worsening palpitations. I trusted our old uh, evaluations, but this patient actually has a dilated right side, as you can notice right here. And if you look really closely, this is a pulmonary vein that's actually inserting into the superior vena cava. So this patient underwent a typical flutter ablation, but they were unfamiliar that he actually had partially repaired congenital heart disease and actually had to undergo a, a congenital heart repair for partial anomalous pulmonary venous return and a maze procedure rather than the typical catheter ablations. So that goes to the guidelines that say catheter ablation should be performed at an institution that's aware of these complex anatomies and the distinctive arrhythmia substrate that's there, as well as pacemaker and device lead placement. That was the original series from 11 years ago. Last year, they basically rehashed the exact same thing. We should be dealing with EP procedures with places and personnel of expertise 3D mapping ablation and the familiarity with the anatomy. We can address uh, the arrhythmia burden of tetralogy of flow that you've heard about and the VT risk, the atrial arrhythmia risk of the AP Fontan connections preoperatively, and then uh, the atrial arrhythmias and the pacemaker placements in patients with transposition of the great arteries and atrial switch, so the mustards and your senings. And that brings me to another 40-year-old mustard patient of ours who was fatigued, they got treated for their hypothyroidism, and they showed up with bradycardia. So I took them to the lab, and most adult electrophysiologists would shoot a venogram, which is being shot here, and they'd say, okay, I see the course of blood going down and into the heart. There you go, let's follow it down. It looks like it's coming down, the typical course, and so I should prep and start placing my pacemaker. But we had done our cardiac catheterization. You see a catheter sitting in the pulmonary artery, and we shot the lateral as well. And when you see the blood flow coming down the SVC, you see a sharp 90 degree turn. This is heading down the azimuth vein. This is 100% occlusion. I promise you, there's the intracardiac cineangiography. 100% occlusion of the superior vena cava and, uh, to the RA baffle. And that's why when you're at a, a center that's familiar with the anatomy and these obstructions, you're going to want to know whether or not this can be then recanalized uh, with a stent. He was, uh, this lefty was also occluded in the right subclavian vein, so we ended up having to deploy the device on her left side with a reasonable result. And just yesterday, we ended up uh, extracting a system from a mustard who ended up having SVC and IVC baffle obstruction, and we had great collaboration with our interventional team again, whether it's implanting devices or extracting devices uh, to ensure that the patient gets an improvement in symptoms. These need to be coordinated at a center of expertise. The next question, what advances are there in catheter ablation today? So most of us would probably quote somewhere between a uh, 60 and 90% success ablation of atrial arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias in our congenital population, depending on the substrate, depending on the duration, compared to some of the 95% successes in our easy lesions like typical flutter, AV nodal rancher tachycardia, Wolf-Parkinson-White and probably lower in the AFib ablations in our congenital patients compared to uh, the standard structurally normal heart. And I like to say these are some of the, the leading things that are out there that are really increasing our ability to find the arrhythmias and successfully ablate them. Uh, catheter ablation, 
If you think about a structurally normal heart, Ryan talked about the SA node conducting to the AV node. So if we had a circuit that was going around the heart because of an incisional scar, you might have an atrial reentrant tachycardia that's going around. By using heat or cold energy, we can disrupt the myocardium, draw a line through the area, and we can uh, terminate the uh, mechanism of the palpitations to reduce or hopefully eliminate their symptoms. Now, irrigated tips work better than our uh, non-irrigated tips. It allows us to get a deeper lesion so that we can burn through scar tissue and deeper into the myocardium in case there's more uh, apoptosis and more uh, scar related to the prior surgical procedures and the hemodynamic changes. We also use magnetic floppy catheters that are guided by magnets at the tip of uh, the area to lead it to areas that are otherwise challenging in the uh, cardiac anatomy. This is one of the patients that we took. This was a detransposition uh, Rastelli procedure. And we ended up doing ablation lesions to isolate the tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve outflow. We drew lines down the septum. And we found that the actual area of origin was coming from a little pocket that came from the, uh, the, numbing, the, the nubbin of the original uh, aortic outflow. So when this was uh, detransposed, uh, it was the, um, the, this other aortic outflow that was the original source. Very challenging to get into, so we ended up using the magnetic-based catheter system to navigate down the aorta and into uh, that pocket to eliminate the arrhythmia. And then contact force. Contact force is one of the hottest things over the last five years or so. And what that allows us to do is we can actually sense how our uh, catheter tips are pressing inside the heart. And we know that if we burn for a certain amount of time with a certain amount of force, we can get a force time integral. A lot of studies are coming out that say, if you deliver a certain amount of energy for a certain amount of time, that amount of damage can be sufficient to cause the type of scar effect that you need to interrupt these circuits. And so that's the area that's showing the 11 grams of force that are being delivered. And though we started off with Star Trek, this is where Star Wars and the Force Awakens to use the force. So, Number seven, what about any improvements to imaging for catheter ablations? The older procedures used to take several hours, and with that degree of fluoroscopy, there was a lot of radiation to your patients and to the practitioners, leading to a lot of back pain from wearing too much lead. But we've now come up with uh, floral light options that allow three-dimensional mapping, as you saw in some of those prior images, and the use of intracardiac ultrasound, or echocardiography, to make sure we know the anatomy to succeed better on our patients. Now, 3D mapping works like this. You get an image of uh, a fictional body. There's the head. Here's the feet. We're looking at a right anterior oblique. The camera is to the right side of the patient. This would be the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the tricuspid valve. If we were ablating typical flutter, we would draw a line from the tricuspid valve all the way back to the inferior vena cava to interrupt a circuit that would go around like this. In the middle of one of our cases, we drew this line and we didn't recognize that it had flipped to an entirely different flutter that was going around the atriotomy site. So this was a former congenital patient. They had bypassed cannulas in the right atrium going up to the superior vena cava and the inferior cave, vena cava, and that's where the circuit was. As soon as we drew a line in this direction, we finally eliminated the flutter and restored sinus rhythm to the patient. And here's a picture of us doing our tetralogy ablation. Here is a, the tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve, and standard isthmus lines drawn from the pulmonary valve down the, the, uh, H, the ventriculotomy patch to the VSD patch and to the tricuspid valve can help to terminate uh, the majority, about 70 to 80 percent of the ventricular arrhythmias in Tetralogy of Fallot. And this is using some of the merging with the fluoroscopy uh, technique called UniView in one of the, uh, the mapping systems. And that allows people who don't have the, uh, as much familiarity with the uh, anatomy to understand at least the anterior-posterior nature of things or the uh, left-right nature of what we're looking at. So this would be the tricuspid valve, the pulmonary valve, the right ventricle, and you can see the lines that we drew between the tricuspid valve and the, uh, and the uh, outflow tract patch.
We also use ultrasound within the heart. So this is called intracardiac echocardiography. And using the ice catheter, we can go into this patient. This was a 45-year-old mustard who had had syncope from a wide complex tachycardia. It appeared that this ventricular tachycardia was actually originating from his right ventricle. This is the interventricular septum, the right ventricular free wall. This would be the moderator band, and this is a papillary muscle. And so the VT seemed to be originating from the moderator band uh, at the uh, insertion site of the papillary muscle, and we did a thorough ablation to that area to help reduce the burden of his ventricular tachycardia. So this would be, for example, the right ventricle, the systemic red right ventricle, and the subpulmonic left ventricle in this mustard patient. And this is what the angiography looks like, so we'll put those back on there. This would be the subpulmonic, uh, uh, subpulmonic left ventricle, the subaortic right ventricle, so our catheter is going up the aorta and we're ablating in the right ventricle along the moderator band. This is our ultrasound catheter seeing where we are, and this is a, uh, a mapping catheter that is helping to localize where the arrhythmia is coming from. Same thing on this side, uh, seeing our ultrasound catheter, using that to, to guide where we are ablating at the moderator band. What's the future of ablation? So we've talked about techniques where we have to put catheters inside the heart, but I kid you not, this was published just in 2017, non-invasive cardiac radiation for the ablation of ventricular tachycardia in human patients. So they'll do imaging and they'll find the area of scar and go ahead and target their radiation to create the same ablative effects without actually having to insert a catheter. And there were actually animal models that were done at the Mayo Clinic. This is Washington University, this is Mayo Clinic, where they did an AV node ablation uh, using photon beams uh, to impact uh, a, I believe this was a pig model or swine model. So our Leela's pacemaker is the next deal. We gave five topics to, to ablations. Let's give uh, five topics over to, uh, to devices. Our Leela's pacemaker is the real deal in adult congenital heart disease. And this is what we're talking about. The novel generation of pacemakers without leads can be found roughly two and a half centimeters here, roughly four centimeters here. This is the FDA approved uh, Micra by Medtronic. And this is the uh, pending FDA approval NanoStem from St. Jude's. And uh, they ha came out roughly four or five years ago. Their publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, how they are inserted into the myocardium using these tines or a screw-in technique. So why isn't it really ready for prime time? The current leadless pacemaker technology is only something called VVI. It can only pace in the ventricle, and it can choose to inhibit if it sees that the ventricle is already pacing. In congenital heart disease, we need atrial pacing from the sinus node dysfunction, or we need AV synchrony because of that AV block, that post-op traumatic AV block. The next iteration of these devices is supposed to be VDD. It'll sense in the ventricle, it, uh, sorry, it'll pace in the ventricle. It can sense in either the upper or the lower chamber, and it can inhibit or it can track. The problem is, this is great for congenital heart block that has functional sinus node. It's not ready for patients who have a lot of scar in their sinus node. And then there are anatomic considerations. Uh, currently, it's only FDA approved to be inserted through the groin. There are some reports that it has been inserted through the neck. But what of the patient, especially for the patients that come in with the occluded femorals? This is not uncommon when I take a patient for a cardiac ablation to find that there's really no roadmap into the heart from the groins, that we have to use the neck in order to get up there. Uh, for the patients with a small right ventricle, such as Epstein's anomaly, there's a lot of real estate that's been taken up. And then what about the systemic ventricle? Could you deploy it and uh, wait for uh, anticoagulation to reduce some thrombotic risk? And how would it integrate with other desired therapies, such as dual chamber pacing, resynchronization therapy, or defibrillators? So it's not yet ready for prime time. What's the state of defibrillators in ACHD? Are they ready? For, for everybody, some believe that we should be considering it, especially when the ventricular uh, dysfunction is great. And so they extrapolate a lot of data from the adult series, such as the SCUD-HEF trial. There are a decent number of inappropriate shocks which have been reduced with uh, the uh, technology out there. But does an increased pacing load lead to more ventricular dysfunction? What about leadless technology? And what about the external wearable defibrillator or the life vest? So the 2A indication for tetralogy of Fallot's, but everybody else is in a 2B for, for defibrillators. And I like to think of the life vest as my bridge to uh, destination, whether destination be an implanted defibrillator, epicardially, subcutaneous, or transvenous. So let's talk a little bit about uh, those indications. So here they are. And Again, a 2B indication is a very soft indication. It's a consider type of guideline for EF that's less than 35% and various other risk factors. And when you look at 
our mustard population or the systemic right ventricular population, you actually look that appropriate shocks were in the secondary population, but really not through the primary prevention in the original transposition mustard sending series. So when you're talking about should we be implanting defibrillators, you really have to think of a way that risk, benefit, and alternatives and make sure that the patient is moving forward with the right reasons. This is the subcutaneous ICD. So its generator is placed uh, beneath the armpit with a single lead that runs outside the ribs. And we did a meta-analysis here at the Texas Heart Institute with uh, several of the folks at Baylor College of Medicine. And what we found is that you still get the same rate of inappropriate shocks as uh, your transvenous systems. So you really have to counsel them for the right reasons. And the latest guidelines that came out basically say if, you're, if you have difficulty with access or you have a high risk of infections, then perhaps this is for you as long as you don't need pacing, anti-tac pacing for VT termination or bradyarrhythmia pacing. So it's going to have a very limited subset, particularly if our patients have sinus node dysfunction or AV block. And on that previous case I showed you, that's what that subcutaneous ICD looks like right next to the sternotomy. And so this is the lead as it rides from the lateral aspect. Here's the generator, and it rides up. And then uh, here it is right here. Uh, it's, uh, the image is actually shown where the heart should be right here, but the uh, lead is sitting right on the sternum. What we just talked about anti-tachycardia pacing. Is it worth it? In the ventricles, it seems like it's worth it. This is the best data that came out of the Vanderbilt group from about se uh, seven years ago. In the adult studies with structurally normal hearts, they tend to say that anti-tach pacing might increase mortality. That's the made it right trial. But in the same year that that came out, our, uh, the series from Vanderbilt showed that in about 80 patients, a quarter of them had received appropriate therapy. And it was highly successful, only almost 90% successful that delivering an anti-tac pacing in the ventricle could convert them back to sinus, which was the same success that they had with uh, shocks. So perhaps that's the right thing for our defibrillators, but I love talking about atrial pacing. As you heard from Ryan, atrial arrhythmias, especially in the severely complex lesions, are out there. So this was a study out of in uh, structurally normal hearts of over a thousand patients, and the progression of atrial fibrillation was halted by about 10% in those that, that uh, anti-tac pacing worked in the atrium. It was almost 50% effective. The higher the efficacy, the less progression of AFib. And when did it work the best? For atrial flutters that were regular and that had transitions back and forth. What do our patients have? Atrial flutter. And so that's why I think that this is really going to be the next realm. One case report that we ended up uh, submitting uh, to ACC last year ended up uh, uh, being a very successful, about an 80% success in one of our Fontans that otherwise had no, uh, virtually no other options. So what's the future of pacing? I think that we're actually going to flip to percutaneous epicardial pacing. So long as scar tissue doesn't impede us, there are at least three institutions, Boston, uh, Mayo Clinic, and I believe uh, Washington, D.C., that are working on epicardial insertions uh, from a trans, uh, transcutaneous route of placing leads around the heart. All of these are in animal models, but essentially, uh, uh, sorry, two of them are in animal models and one of them in a, uh, in a human model, and I think that these are the potential ways of placing leads so long as scar tissue doesn't impede us and many of our sternotomy patients will have the, uh, those issues. The Swiss are working on solar power. So this is still a lead type of device, but the Swiss have found ways to put solar panels so that you can absorb through the skin and maybe that reduces the generator changes and the infections that might be associated with them. And their follow-up study on it basically showed that uh, even on the darkest, gloomiest winter days in, in Switzerland, you still walking around had enough ambient light to power the generator for the entire day. And I think the power of the battery was about three months when it was totally in darkness. And lastly, right across the street, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Mehdi Razavi and uh, Dr. Babakani, are working on this microwave-powered pacemaker that's smaller than a dime. And the interesting part about that is it can be powered externally from a battery and recharged here, so you don't even have to replace anything. It's leadless, and you can put multiple on the heart to get atrial, ventricular, and biventricular pacing. So this is cutting edge and is already um, uh, funded for an NIH uh, research, and hopefully we'll see this in our lifetimes. Finally, I know Corey already touched a little bit on this, but one of the biggest questions I get, a get asked is, are cardiac MRIs ready for all types of devices? And I think it can be done. There's a lot that it can be done for the non-conditionals, and there's a good set of guidelines that were published in 2017 about what types of non-conditional leads can be used and devices can be used for MRIs. 
But last year, this meta-analysis looked at all 70 published studies and series of MRIs. It had about uh, 6,000 MRIs in 5,000 patients, and basically it showed 1% or less complications. So I think we're moving forward pretty quickly. This uh, had about eight epicardial devices. The last horizon is going to be the epicardial devices that are in our Fontans and some of our, our congenital patients. And I think it can be done. What you find here is this is where the generator sits. You get a field artifact, and you can see the leads riding on up. But you actually get pretty good imaging of the anatomy of this Fontan, and you can walk it on down see it beautifully. You can see the liver congestion and the hepatopathy. But uh, I'm really proud of our team, uh, Corey Knoll, uh, Prakash uh, Masan, and Jeff Kim, who are really pushing forward on trying to move towards getting our epicardial devices MRIs. Because if we can get past that last horizon, I think we can uh, clearly say that MRIs could be for most, if not all, patients if monitored closely and uh, safely. And here's another follow-up view of that uh, field effect of the generator. But you get great images of the heart. This is a little bit uh, choppy, but the MRI images when you scroll on a computer look a lot clearer, I promise. OK, so the top 10, ACHD. Know where to find your guidelines. Always try to find your ACHD EP expertise. Ablations are getting better. And so is our imaging, including how adept we are with our intracardiac echoes. But the future will probably be external beam technology. Our leadless uh, pacemakers ready for prime time, not until we can get that atrial communication, uh, atrial pacing as well. SICD does have a role, but if you are going to be pacing, it ha does have its limitations. I'm a huge fan of atrial anti-tac pacing compared to the ventricular uh, anti-tac pacing. The future may be epicardial devices placed by our electrophysiologists, solar recharging, or microwave technology. And I do think that MRIs are going to be prime time for our Fontan patients, those with devices as well. And with that, we'll close off this conference. <laughs>